Welcome and thank you. Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us today for another DIN North America webinar. I am Dina Baptiste, a member of the DIN North America Steering Group and Director of Cancer Screening Guideline Development at the American Cancer Society. I will be your moderator for today's webinar on guideline panels decision making. Before we begin, there are likely new participants uh, today. So allow me to share a brief background on GIN North America. We are a regional community of the larger GIN and includes members from Canada, Mexico and the United States. The webinar series is just one of the ways we facilitate sharing and collaboration in our regional community of Guidelines International Network. So we encourage you to visit the GIN North America website regularly for information and upcoming events in our regional community. Also, the recording of GIN North America webinars are available online. The recording of today's session will be made available in about a week or so. Um, please share with others who may have missed uh, today's live session. Important reminder for everyone um, is that this year's uh, GIN uh, Guideline International Network Conference will be held virtually from October 25th through the 27th. Abstract submissions and registration are now open. Note that abstract submission closes on July 18. So there's still plenty of time for you to submit um, an abstract if you're interested. You may visit the GIN conference webpage, of course, for um, registration and additional information on, on the meeting. Uh, of course, visiting the GIN um, website often is highly encouraged as it's a great platform for the latest news in the guidelines community and resources for members. If you are a GIN member and you have not yet um, signed up for GIN Connect, um, please do so as soon as possible. It's a great platform for um, networking and there are a lot of um, information and resources available for members. Okay, so a few housekeeping items before we begin. Note that this meeting is being recorded. Um, all participants were muted upon entry to the meeting session to facilitate a smooth recording. If you um, somehow find that you are not on mute, please do so at this time. Um, we have allotted time at the end of the presentations for um, question and answers. So throughout the presentation, we ask that you submit your questions um, in the Q&A section. Take a moment to identify the Q&A tab on your screen and use it. The um, uh, presenters may try to answer some of the, those questions during their presentations, but we will have a, a time at the end of the session, at the end of the presentation for answering questions and for discussion. Um, uh, I will convey any questions posted in the Q&A section to the, the speakers at the end of, of, of their presentations. Okay, so let's get to today's talk. Um, in the uh, GIN North America webinars, um, in addition to featuring innovative tools and resources available to guideline developers, um, we have continued to feature ongoing and completed research. Um, today's webinar, is an update of the findings from uh, uh, ongoing research examining the factors um, potentially influencing panel decision making in the development of clinical guidelines. We have two speakers today who are um, very familiar uh, faces within the, the GIN community. Um, Dr. Uh, Benjamin Jobigavish is a professor at uh, Beckman Research Institute of the City of Hope in Duarte, Canada. His research and published work focus on measuring and optimizing clinical research and practice of medicine by understanding both um, natures of medical evidence and um, decision-making. 
And this talk has emerged from his longstanding interest in how people, in this case, guidelines panels, make their decisions. And of course, Dr. Uh, Gordon Guyett is very familiar within the gin um, community. He is a distinguished professor at McMaster University, and he coined the term evidence-based medicine back in 1990, and has since then advocated for evidence-based approaches to um, medical decision-making. Most, maybe all, are familiar with his work, uh, with the GRADE work group for which he's co-founder and co-chair, and he's also co-founder and co-chair and chief medical officer of um, um, the Magic Foundation, which is Making Grade the Irresistible Choice um, Evidence Ecosystem um, Foundation. So I will now um, turn, the, turn the rest of the session over to our speakers. Okay, thanks very much. Lovely introduction. Um, I am now going to go and hopefully share the slides. Um, I'm anticipating that um, people can now see the slide, correct? Somebody yeah, tell me yes. We can see it and hear uh, you well, thank you. Okay, beautiful, thank you very much. So um, there is a paucity of work on the process of how guideline panels make their decision. Uh, and um, under Ben's leadership, uh, the um, ideas for these projects, that this project and others uh, that we're doing in this regard have come from Ben, uh, who has taken the initiative. And I've been extremely grateful um, to be able to play a part and have my input and help Ben with this work. Um, this one uh, is, as you can see, the development of a theoretical framework with empirical support. Um, uh, in the decision-making uh, process of clinical guidelines. Um, my conflicts, I mean, have been for a long time a consultant with uh, UpToDate, and in the introduction, you found out that I'm co-chair of the great working group. Uh, ben has no specific competing interests, and you see there uh, where the money came for doing this project. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to do the intro and uh, the, uh, uh, pro very appropriately, the meat of the presentation will come from Ben, who's going to talk about the design, data collected, qualitative analysis, a social network analysis, and quantitative analyses, and then the conclusions about what we have learned from this project, and also uh, where we might go in subsequent work. So uh, it is no secret to the people on this call that there's a clinicians and policymakers have an enormous uh, reliance on clinical practice guidelines and their production is a major industry for clinician and healthcare organizations. Uh, fortunately, over the last 20 years or so, uh, standards of trustworthy guidelines have been promulgated and are uh, very widely accepted. Uh, more and more still. Still, there's not uh, all guideline groups, all professional organizations adhere to them, but uh, lots do, and more and more are doing so over time. Uh, these criteria include systematic summaries of the best available evidence, a rating of their quality, and various standards in the process of moving from evidence to grade recommendations. Um, I've, uh, you've already heard about my uh, conflicts of interest and anything I say about grades should perhaps be viewed in that regard. However, uh, many, I think, would agree that it's the uh, preeminent approach to these processes in terms of a system of rating quality and certainty of evidence and in moving from evidence to recommendations through the last few years' proposals of evidence to decision frameworks. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, the claim of the preeminent um, uh, system. Uh, we would cite the greater than 110 organizations who have adopted GRADE, including the World Health Organization, the Cochrane Collaboration, um, uh, and leading American groups, American Thoracic Society, American Co College of Physicians, CDC, 
uh, health technology assessment organizations like the uh, Swedish SBU, and from a clinician, clinician point of view, the leading uh, clinical uh, source of guidance for many people all around the world up to date, which has over 10,000 graded recommendations. Um, grade and other guideline systems are what we call normative systems. In other words, they tell people what they ought to consider, or at least suggest to people what they ought to consider uh, clinical guideline panels when they're making their decisions. However, what people should do is often different from what they actually do, ought versus is, or in slightly more sophisticated language, the normative descriptive gap. So we have inputs according to grade of what guideline panels should be considering when they make their decisions and recommendations. So um, they look, you look at the magnitude of the benefits and harms, that's clearly key, but on the left, you have the quality of the evidence and whether the estimates of magnitude of benefits and harms kind of is high or very low quality of evidence will certainly bear in things. Uh, one can never make recommendations just for clinical decisions, just on the basis of evidence. A core principle of evidence-based medicine is the values and preferences of patients in the clinical arena and the target audience of a guideline uh, in the guideline. And uh, recently incorporated in the evidence decision frameworks, a few years now, uh, include issues of resource use, feasibility, acceptability, and equity. So um, what, the, the, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the study of guideline process has been very limited and how much is ought, in other words, people doing what grade and others and many others have suggested and how much it differs from that. And of course, there's a lot of ways of potentially going off the rails because there are many subjective decisions, including uh, none of these, which we try to make them as um, uh, offer uh, as clear guidance as possible, but there's always subjectivity in rating the quality of the evidence in choosing the important outcomes and looking at their relative value in balancing benefits and harms in moving to decisions. Decision analysis is a very uh, quantitative approach, but really has never caught on as a major uh, source of how clinical practice guideline panels actually conduct their work. Um, panel composition is another issue that can enhance apparent trustworthiness uh, with the, the traditional inclusion of research and clinical experts, but also now methodologists, clinicians, patients, ethicists, and uh, sometimes if cost effectiveness is important, economists. So, um, Lots of standards, but how panels actually make their decisions remains a black box, a process to find inputs and outputs, but limited knowledge of its internal workings. So questions, to what extent do panels say that they're using grade adhere to grade standards? What is the role of the chairs and co-chairs relative to other panelists? How does the interaction between panelists happen? Uh, um, to what extent do panelists' individual characteristics influence things and extraneous influences, time available, venue, fatigue? We really do not know at the moment the process of how guideline panels conduct themselves and the influence of all these factors on their decisions. And that may seem like perhaps a little odd that we've got this far without the understanding given the extent of the guideline uh, production industry. So what factors may affect? I've listed some. Here's another um, a way of thinking about it. Um, we can think of evidence-based healthcare factors, uh, those things highlighted by grade, factors in the general literature on decision-making, which we characterize as non-evidence-based healthcare fa factors that may that one may postulate affect guideline panels. And our suggestion is 
addressing the problem requires an explicit theoretical framework which may focus on these uh, evidence-based healthcare and non-evidence-based healthcare factors. Thinking of an extreme example of a non-evidence-based healthcare factor that could conceivably affect decisions, this is not from guidelines, but rather from uh, rulings made by judges uh, with respect to favorable decisions in terms of parole. And you can see what happens is they start out at the beginning of the day uh, with saying making favorable decisions in over 65%, but as they move toward lunch, they get uh, more and more critical, uh, less and less happy, um, and they fall off dramatically and then uh, bump up again after uh, their lunch and then after a subsequent break. Uh, this was, of course, many might think this is unconscionable, but there you are, human beings are human beings. And uh, there's an example of a, uh, within our context, of a non-evidence-based healthcare factor that shouldn't have any influence on the decisions, but actually might. So that was my part of the presentation. Um, ben, um, I'm gonna stop sharing so that you can control your own slides and leave it to you to pick up. Perhaps while, uh, okay, we'll do that, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I have tried to monitor Q and A uh, box. I didn't really see any questions, so. Um, so uh, uh, I will leave it now to you and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Dina to continue monitoring. Uh, uh, now somebody needs to give me, okay, if you guys see my, uh, my presentation. Yes, all good. All good, okay. So I'm just going to really uh, continue um, uh, uh, Gordon's line of uh, thought uh, that basically uh, there are a number of factors that uh, uh, appear to affect the way uh, guidelines make their decisions, but they haven't really systematically evaluated. And so, so really our overarching, overarching goal for this research is to try to disentangle this grade or evidence-based uh, or, or factors or factors identify evidence-based literature with the, and non-grade factors, those in generally identified in a in general decision-making literature in terms of uh, um, uh, evaluating the effect uh, on uh, potential decision-making of a guidelines panel. So about three years ago, when we were starting this project, uh, so, th so, so, so throughout this presentation, I'll try kind of a, to provide some, uh, ask for some uh, opinions or provide some polls or share uh, some previous thought of your group. Uh, and with the, and uh, part of the reason is just to inform, part of it is to entertain, and part is really to invite you to um, continue make any comments because you know, some of these uh, comments that we made uh, three years ago were very important, informative for us as we were actually moving forward. And about three years ago, I guess in, in April 2018, um, I gave this talk, um, uh, which was, as I said at the beginning, at, uh, with the, uh, based on just the data from few panels. And the question was, um, do grade or non-grade factors dominate guidelines panel decision-making? At that time, we had about 90 uh, 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 people who were present uh, uh, in the audience. And basically, as you can see here, people were rather uh, divided on that issue with the decision making uh, based on grade uh, system is driven largely by grade factor or non grade factors or about equally driven. Um, uh, by both grade and non-grade factors. Most people believe that they're kind of equally driven. So throughout the talk, later on the talk, I'll try to give an answer to this, uh, to this question. But as you can see here, at least three years ago, that's what the group, uh, Gin group, which presumably is the, you know, composed of the people who know about guidelines most, they really have been 
uh, are pretty much undivided in terms of which factors drive decision making, even when the guidelines apply a great system uh, to generate, uh, to develop uh, recommendations. And so, so, so as we went through the literature to, to, uh, to uh, design this project, we pretty much identified a number of these factors. And these factors were ultimately uh, operationalized in terms of a 21 uh, distinct factor about, uh, we end up with a four key or five uh, strength recommendation would be out to a fifth. Five key evidence-based great factors and the 17 non-evidence-based, non grade non uh, factors. And they can be broadly characterized on the, you know, the heading of uh, importance of decision features or characteristic of decision recommendation itself, such as uh, you know, making recommendation in, for high stake versus low stake uh, situation, making recommendation uh, you know, in a politically charged atmosphere and those sort of things. Then the factors that are related to those situation, contextual factors, such as, uh, as, as Gordon already mentioned, you know, fatigue, time pressure, cognitive load, and also the, the features of individual uh, member, uh, individual uh, decision maker themselves, you know, the background, the experience, obviously conflict of interest, uh, you know, the decision making style. And so all of these features are potentially are playing a role um, in, a, in, a, in a guidelines panel. So, so um, uh, part of our project is really try to, to kind of uh, assess the importance of each of these factors and how much actually then we can find empirical support uh, in the context of a guidelines panel. Now, ideally, we would love to do uh, uh, experimental study where we would randomize panels to all sorts of different questions, all sorts of different situations, but that despite all the, the best effort that proved to be impossible. So we had to settle to different type of design, which is observational design, it is perspective, and we needed we pretty much piggyback on, on, on the real life work of the guidelines panel. Uh, uh, the, the design, uh, so, so these are the people, these are panels that they made true recommendation that eventually will inform uh, the, um, uh, decision making uh, and, and ultimately uh, outcome of thousands of patients that rely on those recommendations. And we collected data on um, just general demographic, this cognitive style uh, um, uh, before the meeting, also asked the panel, um, uh, panel panelists on, on uh, uh, um, solicited actually the judgment related to these key great factors uh, uh, before the meeting, but after the, uh, after the panel decided uh, which type of recommendation need to make it, then the, the, uh, the, the, the panel would meet and we recorded those deliberation. And uh, um, uh, I should say that in almost all cases by but one, um, uh, the, the meetings occurred in face-to-face -face, uh, setting. In one case, meeting did occur uh, on, uh, on uh, through the uh, on online platform. And then we would actually uh, analyze those recording for qualitative analysis. And then eventually, uh, after the meeting, we recorded consensus from the meeting and asked panelists again on the number of these judgment judgment related to strength recommendations. Uh, the quality of evidence and other things. So overall, we try to be as 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 a, um, burdensome as possible to, to the panelists and uh, um, and uh, and uh, we eventually decided that more not more than sixty minutes of people's time uh, uh, pulling them at three different times would be actually the, the best approach we can hope for. So as I kind of alluded, we did qualitative analysis. Part of the qualitative analysis is delving into social network analysis, so I'm gonna spend some, my time, some time on. And then because we uh, generated a number of, or, 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 or collected um, uh, opinions from the panelists uh, in terms of surveys, eventually we uh, also did quantitative analysis trying to uh, uh, disentangle the importance of these factors I already mentioned. 
So um, to date, uh, uh, we uh, approach and enroll 14 panels, uh, 14 panels in total. Uh, we approach 198 uh, uh, panels, which will be so-called voting panels. Out of these 14, uh, we had some technical glitches in, in collecting data from two panels. Eventually, we end up with uh, 12 panels uh, of uh, which 153 members uh, attended the last uh, or the, the, the meetings. And in, in, in totality, these panel members issued a, a close to 3,000 recommendation, 2,941 recommendation. Um, overall, that was our main, uh, 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 that was our main dependent variable. We had a really high completion rate for the, the, the final strength of recommendation. In terms of a qualitative analysis, we actually had a recording from 13 panels. And as you know, in qualitative analysis, you, call, you record everyone, and we, uh, including those people who are not uh, official voting members, but those will be systematic uh, reviewers, or uh, the, you know the people who otherwise would uh, uh, be invited to give some presentation, but not necessarily uh, vote. And we uh, end up actually collecting data for, uh, from 311 uh, people uh, uh, participating in 13 panels. 54% of, um, of panelists uh, were male, uh, uh, 46 uh, female, age uh, varied uh, from, uh, the median age was 49, varied from 25 to 78. People, these were these are experienced people with median clinical experience, 18, ranging from one to 49 years. And, and conflict of interest reported uh, 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 in, uh, uh, by 75 percent of the panelists. Um, so let me ask you, um, so the question that I would like to get actually in real time, uh, some sort of a polling if possible. Uh, um, uh, okay, here, here it is. We can actually even have a polling, you know, thanks to the, to the miracle, thank you. So, who talks most at the meeting? Uh, so I have a, you know, the discussion equally distributed among all panelists, dominated by chair or co-chair, depends really on the panel, some panel, you know, the, depends on the topic of panel, patient representative. Okay, so that's going to be, okay. Uh, so I'm looking, as I understand it, the people, um, can, can't use the chat, rather the question and answer. If anybody cares to put A, B, C, or D down, then we'll get a sense of what people can say. So far, nobody's, uh, no, no volunteers. Um, uh, the, the poll is live. The poll is live. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so it has yeah, nothing to do with the Q&A. We are at the one minute. We are at the one minute mark, so we are about to. Why are we getting a few more in? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, you can tell even when the polling. Uh, can you? Yeah. If you if you don't mind, give me a signal when the polling. But this is just wonderful, really. It's a. Uh, so. Um, Dr. Jovagovich, I'll be able to submit these um, responses to you after the meeting as well. Thank you so much. This is really super informative. Nice. As you can see, uh, most people believe it's a context dependent, um, and um, and uh, um, so yeah. Just remember what you answered, and let me just uh, um, continue with discussion, uh, uh, and then followed by chair, co-chair, and the patient presented. We nobody thought that patient presented uh, talks most in the meeting, so that's a uh, that's an important point. Okay. So uh, let me, I guess I can continue now. Yes. Will this, will this, how to close the poll? I'm trying to. I closed it. Okay. Yeah, I can close it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, okay. So, so let me just give you a little bit um, uh, results on qualitative analysis that will try to answer the question we just asked. 
in quality, qualitative analysis, um, the, the goal of this is really to, to capture the, the utterances and discussions and try to really get into, into themes and understanding what really uh, what pa um, panels really thought behind that. And so, some of these results are being actually prepared and they haven't been published yet. But, but another technique we use is to understand the entire discussion of the panel as kind of information exchange, information flow. And in general, literatures are telling you that the, the quality of decision making depends on the quality of information flow and how actually the information change is, uh, um, uh, how it is controlled or rather uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and una unable to go among the participants. So that's the goal of uh, uh, social network analysis, which I'm going to go into detail in a minute. So here's the answer to the question of the, uh, the, the first question of Paul. And this is based on all to, um, 12 or 13 panels rather. As you can see here, the panelists, this is a radar, a radar plot on the left side that I hope I can, you can see my cursor. But um, uh, looking on these main grade and non-grade themes, uh, you can basically see among across the, uh, the panels, uh, the discussion of the certainty evidence is the most, by far most common, followed by benefit and harms. All other grade or non-grade factors are blip and almost not seen, and some panels are more discussed than in others, but really almost never, play, play, uh, they never ever actually exceeded uh, um, the uh, amount of discussion devoted to quality of evidence and benefit and harms. In general, panels spend over 50% of time across all the panels debating uh, certainty of evidence or quality of evidence and shares and court shares dominated discussion across the all panels. Remember, we actually have panels uh, 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 in, uh, in diff uh, across the different fields. We had the panels uh, in hematology field. We had the panels in, uh, uh, in the rheumatology field. We had the panels of the GYN, which would be nice. We had the panels in nutrition. So there was no really indication that the topic, uh, the, uh, the, the, the topic determined really extent of the, of, the, of the involvement of particular panel members. So again, chair and co-chair across the, the old, uh, old panels um, did dominate discussion, although in, 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 in the in, uh, in range uh, vary from 25% to 75%, but on, on average it was about 50%. But remember, chair and co-chair represented about 10% of total partic of participant that were responsible for majority of discussion. So, so, I, so that's kind of answered the questions to, to, to the first, uh, the, 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 to answer to the first question we just asked. When we talk about social network analysis, again, I mentioned that the way we use social network uh, analysis premises to, to understand is information flow. And then we understand a little bit more, we delve a little bit more in a patterns in the volume and strength of exchange, who talks to who, how, how the if people reciprocate in the dis, uh, discussions, who is the actually, who controls information more, how far is you, everybody's probably heard um, the six degree separation that came from social network analysis. What is the degree separation of each panelist to the, the center of discussions? And we, who are the really these actors who, who, who do influence and control information? Again, there are a number of metrics that can be used quantitatively to express that. And I'll just briefly analyze some of those or appreciate some of those. Visually, and again, this comes from the one panel so far. Visually, as you can see here, that, uh, that, that the center of discussion is a share, co-chair, and methodologist in, the, in this particular panel. And then in periphery, you see patient uh, representative, some systematic uh, review team uh, numbers, and then different content experts. Um, uh, situated uh, in, a different, in, 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 a, in, a, in a in a different flow of interaction. Overall, about 30% of uh, discussion was devoted to non-grade and 70% to grade factors. 
So this table is just uh, uh, basically the goal of this table is just to quickly just illustrate number of those quantitative uh, uh, so-called centrality measure social network analysis. And basically just here, I just wanna really uh, uh, draw, um, uh, um, uh, draw your attention to for, the, for every single of those, the features, you know, whether the number of the uh, exchanges, whether, uh, whether we're talking about so-called between us or control information or who is, who is the most connected to each other, who is the closest, chain and co-chair methodologies with center of discussion, while patient representative and systematic review teams, who are all this systematic review team are not official members of the, of the, of the panel, they are um, uh, furthest from discussion. When you further look at this visualization discussion, it also really, um, you can think, you, uh, one thing actually emerged, which was a little surprising to us, but it's interesting nevertheless, that almost every single topic that panel discuss actually is a different network um, uh, on its own. As you can see here that um, when we're talking, you know, the, if you're visualizing, for example, the, 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 the the discussion about accessibility to visualizing discussion about benefit and harms or quality of evidence, you see different panel of interaction. But as you would expect, for example, a patient representative who otherwise participate only 1% of the time in, uh, in discussion, they actually did participate where you would actually expect them to participate. For example, patient representative here, one participated in a um, uh, in discussion about accessibility or on the values and preferences or, um, or, or uh, on infeasibility or actually formulation language or guidelines. Um, so, so qualitatively, uh, it appears that patient representatives do actually, uh, 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 they, they do serve the, the role they're supposed to serve, but the extent of the discussion is not as much as, as, uh, as we actually expected. And the same goes for, uh, for systematic review team. These are members who are not official members of the panel, but they do inform discussion because they present evidence. And presentation of evidence at the meeting in itself is the key how actually eventually people will formulate their judgment. So these people are not official member of a, 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 a panel. So you can uh, maybe qualify them, classify them as non, uh, non-grade uh, factors do actually affect some important aspect of deliberation. Now, if you look actually, Another point is that to make here, if you look at visualization of these different theme over time, you can basically see, for example, certainty of evidence, you would expect that, that um, at least we expected before we actually uh, uh, conducted this, um, uh, uh, this analysis, that, uh, that you know, more or less would be same throughout the day. But as you can see here, even discussion on, on, on a single topic changes, it may be not surprising, changes the way how people engage, how discuss, and how eventually participate it, even in this, uh, on a single topic. Ben, there are several yeah, questions to, of please. clarific. So were these deliberations in person or did any take place virtually via Zoom or other platforms? So, so th this one, uh, as I briefly uh, mentioned, uh, this analysis refers only to one uh, panel. Uh, and it, it happened in person about two years ago. Does the, dis does the discussion time include chair moderation of discussions, which could account for disproportionate speaking time? Absolutely does. As you can see here, and uh, I don't have it to, uh, the time in terms of a minute uh, broken for you here, but you can see here housekeeping is, uh, you know, uh, obviously it's inevitable or must for chair to really, uh, uh, you know, take control of the meeting it is uh, part of the of the overall time spent. Yes, as you can see here, housekeeping and uh, uh, just generally how, how the meeting going to occur uh, and uh, providing instructions, yes. Did the patients involved get specific training and support prior to the start of and during the guideline development process? 
I'm going to leave it to you, Gordon, to answer that question. Um, the, uh, the ash panels, um, uh, the, the patients on the ash panels, as I recall, did get some training. Uh, I was not involved with that. And so the extent of the training or its thoroughness or whether it continued during the process, uh, I'm not sure, but there was at least some basic training. Um, next uh, item is a little bit longer. Uh, it's interesting if more methodologists are serving on the panel, the difference in discussions compared to perhaps one methodologist. In the end, what is accepted and is published though is determined by the journal or publishing entity. It is noted that what many clinicians actually want is just the results. Perhaps a large number really do not look at the science or the methods. This might be a comment though perhaps is a question regarding how many methodologists on a committee are too many or too few? I mean, you know, I would leave that for the for the discussion because, uh, because there will be some other uh, results that we will put in in a perspective here. Um, the quick answer from my perspective, I don't know the answer to that question in terms of how many, how few, but uh, because we will discuss some other things, maybe um, the answer will emerge or maybe further thought we can elicit it. But, you know, Gordon, please, you know, uh, you know, jump in and, you know. Uh, okay, we're starting to get quite long comments, which is great. Um, but um, I think maybe <clears throat> maybe these would be better left to, uh, if something comes up like the um, issues of clarification, which you did a great job of clarifying, thanks Ben, um, I will certainly ask those. But for the longer ones, I think we might leave them to the discussion. Is that okay, Ben? Yeah, that, I think that, 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 that will be actually, uh, yeah, that will be most reasonable. Thank you, Val. But yeah, feel free to... to make a comment or inter interrupt or anything. Um, uh, so remember that uh, that uh, slide Gordon showed at the beginning, which was really so intriguing about how judges make, uh, um, uh, how, 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 how judges made those decisions about parole. And all of us have, you know, when we prepare this, uh, this, uh, the, the, this uh, proposal, you know, we have discussed about that. We all aware that uh, look, you know, people are checking their emails, uh, they, uh, they, you know, they, they, they texting. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the, the time is limited. Although it's a two, typically these meetings were two days. Nevertheless, you know, some people have to leave earlier. They have to catch the plane. I mean, there's a, all sort of things that distraction. And including time of the day, if, you know, that's called so-called the glucose or eliminate hypothesis when we are hungry that, you know, that our cognitive resources are depleted, play the role. So we try to really address that. We would love to see this beautiful graph that you saw it with the judges. We didn't really, uh, we didn't find that so compelling the way they did it. But nevertheless, we did find some, some statistical um, uh, relationship showing that breaks appear to affect uh, debate in the guidelines panel. We actually, to our surprise, we found the, the, the so, uh, so the, the two breaks, uh, we found a significant effect of so uh, three, uh, three breaks. Um, one after the first break, uh, the first break of the first days and first break of the second break. Um, that didn't really fit the hypothesis of glucose, uh, glucose uh, uh, or eliminate uh, cognitive resource depletion hypothesis because usually, as you well know, the first first day, first break, people are still energized, but they kind of a little bit careful how to, you know, they, they kind of are still, you know, trying the water, so to speak. But um, and so usually you would expect that the, the, the discussion intensify after first break. And that's ex exactly what we, uh, uh, what we noticed. The discussion is actually intensified. Correlation is rather moderate, but still significantly significant. And we saw it in the first and second day. We saw actually at the very last day, uh, again, you know, moderate decent correlation when people actually had the last break and they just wanted to finish the, 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 the meeting off. And as you would expect, that's what we, we observed basically that people were engaged in discussion, they just continue and finished off the discussion. 
we did uh, we did uh, think or we hope that we would detect actually effect of lunch at the meeting, but turned out in this panel that they had a working lunch, so therefore actually we couldn't detect the effect of the lunch at the meeting. So so yeah, so the breaks do make a difference, and that's something that that um, uh, panel need to pay attention to. So let me just summarize this uh, the quality of social network analysis data that uh, the result that I just presented to. So overall, uh, the, uh, the, the, the conversation pattern indicated very dense, well-connected network. People actually are, you know, the, you know when we say dense network, um, that means really the, that, uh, that uh, the similar discussion can be expected whether one or two people actually are left out from discussion or, or not. You know, people are very well connected. Everybody could reach everyone within a less than so-called two distance in the patient representative as well as, as the people who, who dominated most discussion. Great topics on quality evidence, benefit and harms accounted for 46% of all discussion. So again, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, uh, uh, certainty evidence and benefit and harms is, is the, 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 the focus of the, of, the, of the debate on every single panel and, uh, and however you measure it. Non-grade factors in this panel, about 30% of the discussion. Patient par partners, so interestingly, did that participate the way you wanted them participate um, uh, in terms of uh, different topics. They participate only 1% of our total discussions. Collectively, chair, co-chair, and methodologists initiated 53% and received 60% of all communication. 42% of all communication that we, we among these three people. So that's important to, to kind of realize as well. They talk mostly to each other as well. In terms of a really all these social network um, metrics, the, you know, the, something called betweenness, closeness, eigenvector, those kinds. Um, chair, co-chair, and methodologists exerted the highest influence of discussion, controlled information flow, and we're the center of almost all discussion. And then finally, as I already mentioned, the breaks did matter. Um, and we actually uh, see the effect of morning breaks uh, on both days and effect of the last break on day two. Okay, so this is the one of the, which kind of uh, maybe repetition mostly for conclusion, but I don't know if we have a, uh, another poll here, but which factors matter most to guidelines panel? Yeah, the poll? yeah please. Okay, so it, it, yeah, I'm still going. Yeah. This was not best worded question, by the <laughs> way. Uh, so um, yeah, but anyhow, it's more for fun. Um, um, uh, and, and, and really what I meant here is which factor matter most, rather which factors may end up uh, affecting uh, discussion modes. For them, it's like different things. Nevertheless, it's more than fun. So uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, I'll leave it to you, Yarada, just whenever you want to close yeah, the poll. Yeah, I'll end it. Okay, great. Okay, so great factors matter the most. I think that's, that's important to know, and I'll just continue um, uh, discussion now. Okay. Okay, so let me just go now to the quantitative analysis, trying to dissect those factors that we just kind of briefly uh, voted on. And in quantitative analysis, remember, I actually, we, 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 uh, uh, we recorded uh, people's, uh, elicited people's opinion on number of these grade and non-grade factors. And then uh, we tried to associate those 21 variables that I mentioned with a, a key dependent variables. It, it dependent variables here is a strength recommendation. And strength recommendation can be expressed uh, typically as a, you know, weak or conditional or strong. 
in, a, in, in that case, we would do actually logistic regression analysis, but some panels also used actually, uh, the, they couldn't really make the recommendation. So there'll be three categories, you know, they, they, they couldn't make recommendation neither for or against um, uh, um, uh, intervention or made the weak or strong recommendation. In that case, we did the order of logistic regression. It's mixed effect multivariate analysis because we needed to account uh, clustering or judgment also within every single panelist, but also within the panel. So this so-called two two level hierarchical random effect um, um, uh, uh, the model uh, to take this those clustering or judgments uh, into consideration. Now, when we are talking about uh, about making recommendations, and Gordon mentioned about. Uh, uh, the, 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 the great represent a uh, normative system, how we should be, or how panels should be making those recommendations versus how, uh, you know, which factors actually end up affecting how panel in reality make recommendations. So, so when we talk about normative or how or should be making recommendation, the, the, it, the, that's a very closely linked to, to the issue about what is the rational decision-making. There are many theories of decision-making, but across all these many theories, two key ingredients are always present. One is you know, people, uh, make, uh, people uh, make rational decision by consider considering gains versus losses, meaning benefit versus harms. In our case, is really in, in order to fulfill our goals of better health. And we need reliable evidence in order to achieve those goals. So in other words, the, the consideration of benefit and harms, so or balanced benefit and harms, and certainty of evidence are two necessary condition may not be so sufficient but necessary condition to issue um, a recommendation. And, um, and again, normatively, uh, the, 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 the higher benefit over harms and the, 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 the higher certain, you know, the more confident we are, the higher certainty of evidence, we would expect that panelists would issue stronger recommendation in favor of that intervention. But remember that the way how guidelines panel may uh, the, the, the develop their recommendations, they use PICO format. You know, everybody's familiar with the PICO patient intervention comparator or outcomes. And so there's always comparison. When we are issuing recommendation in favor of one recommendation, we basically are saying we are actually then issuing recommendation against the comparator. Therefore, you can think. In our attempt to answer the black box operation, what are the three key factors that influence um, uh, the, the panelist um, decision most? You can think about, we, we come up with this, what we call it U-curve model. The, so, so if, so, um, the, 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 the higher certainty evidence, higher benefit and harm is a stronger recommendation for, inter, uh, for for, for, uh, for endorsing particular intervention. And the uh, mirror picture of that would be stronger recommendation for an endorsing comparator or being rather against the intervention. All other factors, grade or non-grade other factors can be envisaged here to affect actually, uh, uh, to, 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 to move this U curve um, uh, up or down or, more, or, 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 or left to the right. But, but, but essentially U curve will be actually uh, pretty much function of uncertainty evidence and benefit harm according to this model. And so that's what we try to, to then try to see, uh, uh, that, that's what we're trying to really test whether, whether this reasoning, whether this model is correct. As I mentioned, there's a 21 variables, we put them in a model, and when you put all these variables in the model, invariably there's some some uh, some uh, some variables will be statistically significant, others um, uh, uh, you'll be less so. Um, and then we found about um, seven variables that are statistically significant. The problem is, uh, as you all of you, as any of you actually done all of this uh, statistical um, uh, 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 modeling. 
the, the, the way the, if you drop one of these variables, one of these statistical variables loses significance. So when we tested all these number of the model, two variables that always remain significant with certainty evidence and, and balance and benefit and harms and most important interaction of these two variables. Other variables that sometimes were significant, sometimes were not, were cost and, uh, you know, the consideration of cost resources, values and preferences, or a role on the panel, and also some decision-making styles. But again, the different models, the, these different models were rather unstable. And, but, and the most important, when we actually tested the simple model, model based on certainty evidence and interaction benefit and harms, it proved to have a more explanatory power than model based on all other 21 variables. So that led us to conclude that in this black box operation, however you slice the dices, panels integrate these two or consider these two, 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 uh, two factors. And again, you know, these are now empirical data and it shows you uh, that, uh, that uh, 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 that whether we're talking about, uh, you know, logistic regression or the logistic meaning, whether we, uh, we, uh, whether we're expressing data in terms of uh, uh, weak versus strong or, or neither weak versus strong, we see nice, um, uh, nice separation of the, uh, of the strength recommendation as a function of certainty evidence and benefit and, uh, and harms when recommendation issue in favor of, of, of intervention. But we don't really see that separation. I hope you see, you, you can see my cursor. When that um, recommendation is issued against intervention. So in other words, uh, we started with the U curve model, but we end up with the so-called J curve model. So, um, so, um, so uh, you don't really see you don't really see that um, uh, uh, we don't see that really mirror picture uh, as we theoretically expected um, uh, you know, that uh, in the, in, uh, intervention and in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, the strength of recommendation in favor of recommendation would be actually mirror, uh, be mirrored by strength of recommendation. Uh, uh, against that intervention, meaning in favor of comparator, we rather see that that uh, strength recommendation uh, in favor of intervention is nicely separated as a function of benefit and the harms and certainty evidence, but we don't really see that uh, when uh, panelists uh, voted against recommendation. Uh, and so I hope I explained this uh, relatively complex uh, um, graph uh, that everybody can understand. If not, I'm happy to, to, to clarify that further. But a few years ago, we actually did ask the same questions. Uh, we asked this, uh, questions, do the, same, uh, do, fact, do the same factors affect guidelines panel member when they vote for versus against health interventions? And at that time, people were completely divided. And I just wonder uh, whether if, I don't know if we have a, or rather if you have a poll now or not, but I just wonder what's opinion now. But at the time, complete uncertainty, people were divided um, um, uh, uh, one way or another. So I don't know if there will be poll or not. Yeah, the little bit more. Yeah, let's see what you guys think now. Okay, so it's kind of different uh, questions. Unfortunately, I changed my presentation. Uh, um, and so you are answering different questions that will come a little bit later, but let's just remember it. The question that you're answering now, do panel member modify opinion as a result of the meeting discussion? Our judgment, of the panel is stable. So it's different, unfortunately, I, I, it's my fault. I, I changed all the presentation and uh, the, the, the presentation that I sent to, um, to Dina Arado a few days ago had the difference, so sorry about that. But do remember this, this is interesting. You know, the, 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 when it comes a little, in a little bit later about uh, do panel members 
um, uh, modify the, the opinions and results of the discussion. Are they judgments of stable? Most of you believe they have stable discussions. Oh, our judgments. So you see bad, bad, bad questions. Do you, uh, yeah, I, I should, now I realize how bad question is. Um, so I would like to know, do you think that the panelists that may change the result of discussion? And if they do change, that means actually the, 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 the panel member jumpers are not stable. Um, if, they, they, uh, if they do not change, that means the panel member will be stable. Sorry about that, but it will be fun later on to discuss that. So, okay. So, so let me just continue a thought um, about for versus against uh, intervention. Um, so, so why is it that the, the panel members, uh, 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 panel member actually vote differently? Uh, 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 why, why we could not see actually this, uh, the, the, uh, why effect, certainty of evidence and benefit and harm didn't make a difference um, uh, when they voted against versus when they voted for, uh, for intervention. Because as you remember, we started a new curve, which sh should have, uh, which theoretically told us that should be the case, and we end up with J curve, where we actually notice only that uh, that uh, that, it, uh, that uh, certain evidence benefit harms matters when they voted in favor of recommendation, but not against that. And one explanation is that the panel, like individual, can be actually prone to so-called yes bias. It's been known in, the, in individuals, never really shown in, a, in the setting of the group decision making, by the way. This would be first part time. It may show that individuals actually have a more problem voting against than for uh, intervention due to, so, due to so called yes bias. That's uh, defined as a tendency to, to acquiesce with a statement that requires less cognitive effort than when rejecting a given statement. So you can imagine. You can imagine in a, in a busy meeting when everybody is really just checking uh, the you know, text or emails and people say, how are we voting for? Yeah, and they kind of uh, raising the, 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 or the mumbling or they're raising their hands that they may not necessarily uh, um, think this through. So indeed, that's what we saw. We, uh, we continue and we've done it many times now across the many guidelines, panels, Every time you have a, 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 a relation, the, the relationship between the certainty evidence and strength recommendations always holds up when actually guidelines issue recommendation in favor, recommend, uh, in favor of, of, of a particular intervention. But that relationship is flat, completely flat. There's, it seems that uh, certainty evidence does not play any role when, a, when, the, when the guidelines panel um, uh, issue recommendation against intervention. Um, uh, uh, when guidelines panel issue recommendation in favor, uh, in, uh, uh, in favor intervention, and when benefits is higher than uh, uh, in benefits, uh, the, the balance of benefits, the, the balance of benefit harms in, in the favor, uh, the, 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 the favor intervention, then basically we're repeatedly saying a high level of agreement in the number of, in the, in the, uh, um, in the, uh, of the panelists in terms of the proportion of the, of the probability of endorsing such recommendation. In fact, with this certain depth this high and benefit outweighs harms considerably, 90% of, of panelists overall would endorse such recommendation. And so, as you well know, uh, today's quality of care is a lot of uh, is, is uh, typically measured through the quality indicators, the performance measures, by actually um, uh, addressing the adherence of the of the of the physicians to you know to particular to the gu to particular guidelines recommendation. There are thousands of those recommendations, uh, the quality indicators out there, but we think really, and mo most are not really valid. We think actually the quality indicated that, that seems that will be most reliable and robust is the one 
based on issuing recommendation in favor, issuing uh, the, the strong recommendation in favor of intervention and then benefits outweigh harm. That's just a little digression in terms of what does do finding means for overall um, healthcare delivery. Okay. So the one that we everybody always asks, what about conflict of interest? Does conflict of interest affect panel member judgment? I, I should mention now, this, uh, from now on, I'm moving to the area that we don't have, that, you know, so far I've reviewed the, the most robust results that we obtained from our research. Now I'm moving to the area we don't really have a, we have some data, but not super robust data. And conflict of interest will be one of those. And most of you believe that conflict of interest do affect the judgment. The question is how, you know, when we're talking about the judgment, we're talking about whether, for example, conflict of interest affect the way people uh, people issue, um, whether their strength recommendation would be different or quality evidence would be different. And the results that we actually collected so far really are just kind of a inconclusive. If you just analyze data in terms of uh, whether people with conflict issues, stronger or weaker recommendations, just a binary, we didn't really see that's on the left part of the side. We didn't see any, 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 any difference, statistically significant difference. In the middle is assess, assessment of, 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 of a probability of issuing strong recommendation uh, in favor of intervention if you were asked to recuse from panel versus, versus actually if you participated in the panel, because number of times actually some panels were recused from participation. And we got this borderline significance. Indeed, people who were asked to recuse from the panel, they appeared to actually, they would have voted or would have issued a stronger recommendation in favor of that intervention if they stayed on the panel. So that kind of gives you a little, uh, um, uh, little insight that uh, that that possibly recusing these people from the from the panel was a smart idea. Nevertheless, as I said, it was borderline significant. And finally, uh, some panel uh, some panel collected interestingly number of conflicts. And when we just counted number of conflict, we don't have, don't have this for all panel, just for some panel. When we counted all the number of conflict, those the those panelists who have a more conflict tend to issue stronger recommendation. So it appears, so although we don't have any conclusive data, it appears that do conflict do actually appear to affect the judgment, but we would love to do more research on this. But it, again, that's what they show so far. Now, we already talked about, uh, we just had a poll about um, uh, whether, whether judgments of panel is stable. And most of you, I realize only now that the question was not uh, uh, formulated in the best way. But, um, uh, but remember, uh, there's a tremendous effort uh, uh, to select the best world expert to sit on the, on the, on, on, on the, on, uh, on the panel. And part of this is, uh, you know, assuring legitimacy of a of, uh, of process, uh, and there's some other reason. But from the point of view, whether from the point of view whether those the, these people make most accurate and reliable judgment, um, the the premise for that is based on understanding. Look, these are the experts in the field. They've been in the field for a long time. They have a very very well, very well formed and stable judgment. Therefore. You know they know the stuff. They you know the meeting shouldn't really affect much about uh, what they've worked for years and years, and so you would think that the, the that the one meeting which uh, wouldn't really affect what they you know the years of their research or or the way they thought or they behave in a, an everyday clinical work. 
Well, it turned out actually the judgment on almost all, not on all grade factors, tremendously change. And we don't have data for all of our panelists, by the way, there's only about four, 70 or so. Yeah. Dramatically change um, uh, from 67% on certain evidence to, to 92% of benefit harms is uh, when, the, when you ask them opinion on particular recommendation before the meeting versus after the meeting. That was really kind of a surprise for us. In general, we noticed low agreement between individual panel judgment, uh, low agreement uh, between individual uh, panel member uh, uh, judgment and the consensus uh, of the panel. However, it, uh, for at least in two panels for which we had a data, uh, we saw that, that, that agreement changed significantly from you know, to, to fair to, to moderate uh, as a result of discussion. So it appears the discussion does affect the people's judgment. And so then when, you, when that's the case, you ask, why is that so? Why, why, how does meeting work? And we came up with the two alternative uh, hypotheses or, or explanations. So why do best world experts, you know, modify their judgment as a, result, as a result of meeting discussion? One is what's known as a knowledge activation theory. As you know, you go to the meeting, you're not maybe the main presenter. And so you kind of, uh, your, your, your knowledge is uh, passively activated. You had a particular knowledge, but you now actually, uh, the meeting facilitated access to that knowledge that you always had but you know, wasn't really activated before the meeting. And typically that occur via instruction effect. You know, the, the, the chair gives instructions um, and it's very well known that high ability participant that will be world expert basically, they're able to follow instruction and to suppress their prior beliefs or even any, any in some cases even biases. So, so, so maybe that has a, you know, instruction effect and knowledge activation Basically, it's, well, it's what actually happened and how that's how meeting actually worked. Another, you know, less segment type of uh, explanation is maybe this is just a social loafing, it's a conformist attitude and apparent consensus that we saw basically is just a classical um, uh, conformism, particularly when we see that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the agreement is, is low between the individual uh, panel, um, members vote and uh, consensus, and then and that chair and co-chair really drives most of the process. So, 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 so that's kind of a really key dilemma and that, 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 that we are trying to highlight basically. So on one hand, you go and, and collect, uh, you know, uh, uh, compose the group of the, of, the, of the panels in order to really tap in their collective intelligence, their collective wisdom. The best way to do is to pull the independent judgment. But then on a, but at the same time, we see that these judgments are not stable, that you know you have really few members of panel that, 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 that you know that drive the process. So an environment does not appear to be super conducive to you know to tap in this collective experience or expertise. And so that you wonder whether this is what, you know, the ash almost 60 years ago, more than 60 years ago, really warned about uh, how, how consensus can be polluted. And it's, 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 it's uh, you know, you know it's, it's, it's writing uh, is worth repeating even now. Consensus, he said, is an, is an indispensable condition in complex society, but consensus to be productive requires that each individual contribute independently out of experience and insight. When consensus is produced by conformity, social process is polluted. And that is really what, what we worry about. Uh, the, you know, the, so, so the question is now, I don't, I don't really know whether we have this question or other or not, yeah, because I changed some of it. Yeah, we do actually. So what do you think? Do individual panel members, the way you understand the guidelines panel today, do individual panel represent views of the entire panel, meaning collective expertise or reflect view of the members driving the consensus process? So.
So, so you, the most of you believe that uh, the that current guidelines process do represent views of few members rather than views of the entire panel. That is really uh, interesting uh, uh, and very important, actually, I would say, as we move forward with the guidelines the process. Um, And so, yeah, I don't know if I have this question, but the, one of the questions I'll, I'll put this, uh, so one of the, again, the, as I alluded to you, we, the general, we, we, we actually, uh, you know, we, the, the guidelines, uh, guidelines uh, recommendations represent group process. So in a group, usually 10 to 20 individuals, which go them review the, in the beginning of the talk. And general assumption is there that the group judgments are more accurate than individual decision makers. And therefore we go through this major effort to select the best expert on, 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 uh, uh, for the panel. However, empirical work on group versus individuals is far from certain that groups actually the groups actually rarely outperform their best members. And so that is the really, uh, so, so the, the and, 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 and the, one of the most fundamental problems in social decision making, including guidelines panel is really how we aggregate people's judgment in, in preference to represent the collective choice. And that, you know, that goes for the last 200 years, usually in the setting of the democratic vote, you know, as you, you know, some of you may be from New York City, and New York City is now, for example, experimenting with the rank-based process. Um, you know, other, other, you know, other constituencies, constituencies experiencing different process. And the same here, basically, which the, which the, what would be best way to express that collective wisdom or entire panel? instead of actually reflecting the, the views of the few. So this would be, I don't know if we have this vote. This would be, for example, just kind of asking, yeah, should we go by majority vote or plurality of vote or what we think is the best expert? You know, somebody who knows the great best in this context, averaging out, we just take average or we just go whatever chair or chair because they kind of, uh, you know, they, they derive consensus. So we'll, what do we think would be the best actually? Um, so, the, you know, arguably we, we here for trustworthiness and accuracy, but we also here also for, for uh, um, uh, I guess for legitimacy and representativeness, which makes little uh, things little, a uh, little, uh, uh, yeah. So majority, most people believe here that, um, you know, 70% uh, or 4% that the majority, we should go by majority of all. Well, let's just see what data showed. And we don't, again, this is, this, we don't have robust data here. We have a, just a preliminary data. And so when we looked actually these different methods, uh, you know, majority, plurality, averages, uh, best, uh, you know, we actually, you know, they, they, they do agree uh, with the consensus vote better than chance, but overall agreement is only slight to fair, as you can see here, just the, 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 the you know, coefficient is agreement is less than 0.4. Ben, to, ben yeah. um, we've got about 10, 10 minutes left. I'm okay, wondering I think I have, a two, I have two, two more slides and I'm finishing. Okay, um, so, and just, uh, FYI, uh, my internet went down, I got booted off for a while, and when I've come back, I'm having ha trouble accessing the question and answer. Um, I think uh, Deanna is trying to help me regain access, but you may have to look at it. Okay, so let me, okay, anyhow, just to show you, we don't already know what's the best with data so, so far, in our preliminary, preliminary data, um, and uh, we don't, there's no method so far. And again, very few numbers that we have to show that one is the better than others. And, um, and, uh, and, and then some agreement metrics even generated negative, negative and the consensus. Okay, so here's my last two slides. Here's the basically summary of what we talked about, what we learned so far. These are the, these, these are the most robust data that we need. So in terms of, uh, Remember, we set out to assess what are the most important evidence-based, 
grade-based factor versus non-grade factors. In terms of evidence-based factors, certainty evidence and ba balance of benefit and harms um, uh, drive um, panel decision-making the best. And therefore, conclusion would be they have to pay attention and continue to pay attention to that, which they already had. In terms of non-grade factors, there are a number of those actually that affect, uh, affect uh, the process. One is the, the dominance of, of a few people who chair and co-chairs. Breaks appears to affect the, the debate. Yes, bias is, is a serious problem that can be actually, that needs to be handled uh, um, uh, uh, you know, going forward in most of the, of, the, of, the, of the panelists. What's really interesting when you think about, when you look actually grade manuals or instructions, sometimes you have a feeling that process is a linear. You go nicely linearly from evidence to recommendation, but as, as our social network analysis show, uh, the, the, yeah, really process goes in, in discussion and ebb and a flow. And, um, and it, um, most important here, actually, the panelists who, are, uh, who, who, who actually participate often actually have, uh, they, 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 they judgment may not necessarily be actually their formulated judgment. They may be elicited during the process of the meeting itself. And therefore really this, the, 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 the selection of the people who we believe the most experts really needs to be questioned because of the fact meeting. But overall, overall agreement between the individual panel members and consensus is low. However, despite all of this, we should ask ourselves, does it really matter? Uh, does it affect recommendations? Outside of this yes bias, which really does, which um, uh, potentially affect uh, the, the, uh, and can generate the bias recommendation, we saw really little effect that recommendation were not deliver the way they were intended to deliver. It seems that great, if you are, if you go by grade system and you want to the, the develop the recommendation according to grade system, it seems the grade develops exactly what you intended to develop. Nevertheless, uh, you have to ask whether the grade system, uh, you, do, you delivered your recommendation based on grade system according to chair or co-chair or few members, or whether that was reflected by, by the collective uh, intelligence or wisdom or expertise of the entire panel. And so these are the implications of prescriptive implication of future research. In, in, um, in order to improve accuracy, trustworthiness, and efficiency, as I already mentioned, we need to formulate the question in, in order to avoid the guest bias. We already published the paper on that, and it's a simple to do it. You just chair need to be aware how to do it. Focusing on benefit and harms, uh, uh, balance on uh, certainty of evidence, and benefit and harms can improve efficiency. There are very few situations where low certainty of evidence and you know, benefit uh, about harms or harms greater than benefit would really lead to strong recommendation and level. So immediately, if you see those situations, you can kind of really just quickly develop recommendations that will be always weak and spend your time on other things. So that's in terms of efficiency. In terms of actually, uh, you know, the, 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 the factors, I think the literature is very robust in terms of which factors need to be taken in consideration. And uh, we shouldn't be sp uh, uh, spending more time on identifying new factors. I think we need to spend more time on uh, the process. And process is, you know, including how to facilitate the meeting, particularly how to tap into collective intelligence of the, of the panel. It's because of it's not clear that the world experts are really necessary to be uh, intensively representative. I think the, and whether they contribute beyond what is actually already uh, uh, presented in a systematic review evidence, efforts really need to intensify more on systematic review evidence uh, and, and, uh, and less so on, a, on, a, on a effort to, to, to uh, you know, to en enroll the, you know, the people that may actually have a higher reputation. Nevertheless, strategy to decrease the influence of the chairs and improving actually needs to, needs to, be, needs to be intensified. And uh, finally, I, as I mentioned a minute ago, basically how to aggregate individual panel member judgment to represent the collective, uh, the, the choice in the best way is not clear. That, uh, that is the really most important area of research in our mind. Um, uh, 
in order to capture that, you know, that group intelligence that we are all after and, and, and develop the, the, the accurate, trustworthy, um, and efficient guidelines. And with that, I would like to thank for, um, for your attention and to thank uh, Agency for Healthcare okay Research for supporting this research and number of people who actually helped us enroll this panel, including Robert Kunkel from ASH, Amy Turner and Regina Parker from ACR, Brad Johnson from Nutrient Panel, and uh, Vanessa Delgado from NICE uh, Panel. Thank you so much. Happy to answer any questions. So. Uh, Dr. Gayad and yes. Julie Kovic, I think perhaps let's start with the last question submitted. I think you answered a lot of the questions uh, posed earlier. Um, yes, the last one. Um, are you able to see the questions, Ben? The it's, one by the... It says, what, what are your thoughts about alternative clinical practice guideline framework? like ACC, AHA compared with GRADE? Can there be a harmonization across competing clinical practice guidelines models? I'm going to leave it to Gordon to answer the question. Um, well, um, the details of other models I'm not familiar with. Um, I do not see that there is any possibility of harmonization. Um, GRADE has now what is it, over 30 articles in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology describing details of methods. Um, it, 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 there is nothing else uh, comparable out there. And, um, and the great working group is very open to input from others. We keep revising and hopefully improving our methods. So to the extent that um, the, any harmonization would come from people getting involved in the great working group. And if uh, other uh, approaches have particular benefits, we would be keen to hear about them. We may, I don't know, Gordon, if I'm going to uh, divulge here, but uh, I'll just in general, you know, we, we did notice some problem uh, with ACCHA guidelines, we recently have evaluated them, and they do not appear to have a, 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 a confirmed with the with the evidence-based team evidence-based matrix and principle of aligning certainty evidence with the, with the strength of recommendation. So that that I mean, the paper is being uh, prepared for publication. So so I think I just leave it to that. So one thing, Ben, um, I don't think we'll have a time to discuss it, um, but one comment was as much as we tried, at least some people thought we weren't as clear in our definition of grade and non-grade factors as we might have been, something we might want to think of in uh, future presentations. No, I, I, you know, I agree these are arbitrary, we went grade factors by whatever grade identify them. And, uh, and, and so when we call it non-grade factor, non-grade factor, non-evidence-based, it's not that they're not, not on evidence based but they just haven't been technically, officially, how we want to put it, integrated within the grade. That's, you know, it's a, basically by exclusion, really. Uh, uh, there's, there's, there's really tons of the factors that then find literature with uh, decision making. Some of it uh, found it way in the grade, some of it didn't. And that's really what draw our classification. Thank you so much. Dina, are you getting ready to say thank you? We'll have to close out the webinar. No, yes, thank you so much. And unfortunately, we have um, run out of time. We are at the end of our webinar for today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Um, Gordon Guyad for joining us and also uh, Dr. Benjamin Jovigavish. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time. And all attendees, thank you. Uh, please be mindful that the recording will be available online in about a week. Thanks so much. And if you can send out the, the responses to us, that will be also nice. And thanks for giving us uh, plenty of time to, to say what we wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.